All right, you guys, can you guys all see me and hear me and see my slides? Wonderful, thank you guys so much. Um, all right, so happy Friday to everybody also. Thank you for that, John. Um, today we are gonna delve a little bit further into chapter eight. So hopefully you guys uh, felt pretty good about the chapter seven quiz, especially since some of the chapter eight material we covered on Friday helped you reiterate and kind of re-solidify some of those concepts. Um, I will be posting an Achieve homework for Chapter 8. Right now, I'm going to have it set to be due on Friday of next week. Chapter 8 is the bulkiest and biggest chapter in this section, in this uh, sort of first semester of organic chemistry. So um, we, of course, started on it on Wednesday. We'll take it a little bit further today. And we're really going to spend all of next week on it. So right now I'm having that homework due on Friday. I might push it back to Monday of next week. We'll just kind of see how our pacing goes. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into Chapter 8 stuff. All right. So just to remind you guys of where we've been, you just took your quiz on chapter six about making alkenes using elimination reactions, predominantly talking about E1 and E2 reactions. And also in chapter seven, we um, put those E1 and E2 con uh, reactions in the context of other competing reactions like the SN1 and SN2 reactions. Moving on into chapter seven, we'll be talking about, and we actually have been started on Wednesday, talking about the um, addition reactions of alkenes, or actually chapter eight is about all reactions of alkenes, which are mostly gonna be described as addition reactions, but we'll see a few other kinds as well. And so we've been in a place where we were learning how to make alkenes, and now we're in a place where we're learning how to use those alkenes as starting materials for a new set of reactions. And the first portion of reactions that I'm going to describe really does fall into this um, addition reaction, where we're taking a molecule and adding it across a double bond. So we're taking a pi bond and a sigma bond, and we're using it to generate two new sigma bonds um, in the positions where that double bond used to be. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to briefly remind everybody about what we talked about on Wednesday. And I'm going to focus most of my time on hydration, which is going to be a new um, reaction for you guys today. 
So let's go ahead and, and see what that looks like. So from Wednesday, we talked about the addition of HX as our first addition to alkene, our first type of reaction that we're going to learn about addition to alkenes. And it does go in the Markovnikov orientation. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But mechanistically, this is going to look exactly like the reverse of an E1 elimination, where that pi bond electrons can act nucleophilically to attack an electrophile. In this case, our electrophile is the proton of HBr. We generate a carbocation intermediate when we do that because we're going to protonate just one carbon on the double bond and the other carbon will be left behind with an empty P orbital to give us that carbocation. In this case, it's a symmetrical double bond, so it doesn't matter which side, but the carbocation that's more stable will be the one that's formed, and that is the basis of Markovnikov's rule. But we also generated the R- because our electrons from HBr bond left with the Br, so we have a Br-. That Br- is a great nucleophile, and it can form a new bond with that carbocation empty orbital. So we have a new carbon bromine bond. And like I said, mechanistically, this is exactly the reverse of an E1 elimination. It's a two-step process where we go through a carbocation intermediate. And it does indeed follow Markovnikov's rule. So let me remind you again about Markovnikov's rule. In this example, we have an unsymmetrical alkene, right? We have a, an alkene that is more substituted on one side and less substituted on the other. And with all alkenes, we have two choices for where to add our electrophile. So if we add it to the carbon on the right, as it's drawn here, we generate a tertiary carbocation because we've added our proton to the less substituted side. If we add our proton to the left carbon, we add it to the more substituted carbon, leaving behind the less substituted carbon to have the empty P orbital. And that less substituted carbon is not as stable as a tertiary carbocation would be. So this top pathway predominates, and this carbocation stability is really what is going to help us predict product patterns. So I rewrote Markovnikov's rule, the extended version, because I think that's really the most effective version. What that version tells us is that when we're doing electrophilic addition, that electrophile is going to add in the way that's going to generate the most stable intermediate, which in this case is the most stable carbocation up here in the top right, the tertiary carbocation. And so this, uh, the product that we get out of addition of HX is a Markovnikov product. What if we want the other one? Well, we learned that on Wednesday also. If we want the other version, the other regiochemistry, so an anti-Markovnikov product, what we have to do is use an additive in our reaction, in this case, peroxides. And what that does is force our HPR addition, instead of going through a carbocation mechanism, it's going to go through a radical mechanism in a chain reaction that's similar to what we've seen in chapters four and six. In this case, when we use peroxides in HPR, we're going to have a, an initiation step where we generate a bromine radical. And that bromine radical will add directly to that double bond on one of the two carbons. And it's going to generate a carbon radical. Now it's going to generate the one that is more stable, which is indeed the more substituted one. So still in this pathway, our bromine is getting um, added first. And that's the difference here between this radical pathway and the electrophilic addition pathway. In the radical pathway, the bromine is added first to give you the more stable carbon-based radical, which then goes on and attacks a new molecule of HBr in a radical fashion to get you your carbon-hydrogen bond. And you'll notice that this orientation is exactly reverse of the electrophilic addition case that we would have if we did not add the peroxides. So in both cases, we are still going through the most stable intermediate. These are all cases where it doesn't make any sense for you to try to just memorize, is it going to be Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? The safer bet, the safer bet is understanding the mechanism of each reaction and using the fundamental tools that we've talked about throughout the semester to be able to see if I have peroxides, that's going to be a radical pathway. And then follow along with the radical pathway that you would expect to give the most most stable radical intermediate. 
So I've condensed a couple of slides from last time in order to present this kind of more succinctly this time, but I encourage everybody to go back and re uh, review the slides from our last class for the anti-Markovnikov edition of HBR to alkenes using this free radical mechanism. So that covers what we talked about on Wednesday. And what I want to do with the rest of class is move on to another type of reaction from chapter eight, which is the hydration of alkenes, which is exactly what it sounds like. If you're going to hydrate yourself, that means you're going to drink a lot of water, right? In this case, we're going to hydrate the alkene in question, which means we are going to add a water molecule across that double bond. So when I show you this reaction, you're going to see and feel, hopefully, intuitively, the parallels between hydration mechanism and the electrophilic addition of HX. These are going to be very parallel reactions. So let's take a look. So overall, the reaction we're talking about is taking an alkene and adding a water molecule across that double bond to give us an alcohol product. So we're going to take the pi bond electrons and one of the sigma bonds of water and we're going to make two new sigma bonds where we have a new CH bond and a new carbon oxygen bond. And so that water molecule is split in half and um, distributed, if you will, across that double bond. And this does happen in Markovnikov orientation, but we will talk about why that is. And hopefully you guys are already thinking for yourselves about why that might be as you're thinking about the parallels between this reaction and an HX electrophilic addition. So um, in addition to the features of this reaction that I just talked about, I do want to point out this reaction is going to be exactly the reverse of a dehydration of an alcohol. So in chapter seven, we learned about dehydration of an alcohol to give you an alkene. And this is indeed exactly the reverse of that, both in the total reaction that we see and in the mechanistic steps. In this reaction, we're going to use dilute solutions of sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid. And the way that this, this is an equilibrium reaction. So the way it's going to work is that if we use a dilute solution, that means we have a lot of water around and that water will drive the equilibrium towards the alcohol product. Okay. So mechanistically, what does this look like? Well, there are going to be three steps. It's exactly the reverse of an E1 dehydration mechanism. So we're going to do those steps in reverse. These are electrophilic addition reactions. So they're going to follow our same theme that we'll be talking about over and over again throughout chapter eight. We have pi bond electrons and those pi bond electrons are going to act as a nucleophile to attack an electrophile. In this case, our electrophile happens to be a proton. This can be from a protonated water, or it can be from that sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, either way. But we are going to protonate our double bond, and we're going to protonate it so that that proton ends up on the less substituted carbon, so that the carbocation left behind is the more substituted carbon. So if we've, pro if we've uh, now grabbed a proton from our protonated water molecule, we've generated a carbocation intermediate and we've got a lot of water hanging around because I told you we were going to do this in a dilute solution. So what kind of a molecule or what kind of a site, what kind of reactivity would you expect from this carbocation? It's an electrophile, right? And we just generated this electrophile and we've got tons of this nucleophile around. So that is indeed what happens. We have water attack at that carbocation to form our new carbon oxygen bond. So now we've formed our two new bonds. We're almost done. Our last step, just to keep track of all of our bits and pieces and, and take care of all of our electrons, our last step is to deprotonate that alcohol using another molecule of our solvent, which is water in this case. And that gets us to our product, which is now an alcohol, where we have added water across that original double bond. So hopefully you guys can see that this is indeed mechanistically step-by-step pair of electrons by pair of electrons, it is exactly the reverse of the E1 elimination of alcohols that we've already talked about in a previous chapter. Okay, so it does indeed go under a Markovnikov rule, and this should make sense to you because we're forming a free carbocation intermediate. So when that protonation step occurs, which is the first 
new bond formation, that protonation will occur on the less substituted end of the double bond because that gives us the carbocation in the more substituted side, which is the more stable carbocation. So again, this is Markovnikov's rule. And again, I'm just gonna encourage you, I would say one more time, except I'm not gonna be one more time, I'm gonna to continue to encourage you guys. My most strongest advice that I can give you guys for this is to make sure you understand the mechanisms that are happening here. And don't just try to memorize because we're gonna learn something like 12 reactions in this chapter. And they're all gonna to have to be either Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. So unless you have some way of distinguishing them and the way of distinguishing them is the mechanism, it is really hard to just pack all of this into your memory without having the concepts behind it in there to help solidify that. Okay, so we've been talking about adding water to alkenes, the hydration of alkenes. So if I have this particular alkene and I wanna add water across this double bond, it turns out that I am out of luck. I cannot do that in, a, in an efficient manner using this hydration that we've talked about where we have dilute acid, um, in this case, dilute sulfuric acid. Instead, when I subject this alkene to the conditions that I expect to do hydration in a Markovnikov fashion, I actually get this as a major product where the hydrogen atom of our water molecule is over here on this carbon, and the OH group from our water, our water molecule is all the way over here on this other carbon, which was not the carbon of the double bond. So why is that the case? How could this happen? And if you guys have been thinking about the types of things we've talked about, the similar themes and concepts that we've gone through before, you'll be preempting me and guessing that this is a carbocation rearrangement, which indeed it is. So in this case, we can undergo a carbocation rearrangement that happens by way of, in this case, a methyl shift. So these are the types of alkyl shifts that we talked about in chapter seven with, that can happen with any E1 elimination because they also go through a free carbocation intermediate. So in chapter seven, we learned about a hydride shift or an alkyl shift. And we learned that whichever the smallest substituent is would be the most likely one to shift. So the goal here always is to make a more stable carbocation. And so we can see if we do a direct protonation of our double bond using those pi electrons as the nucleophilic electrons, between those two carbons, just these two carbons of the double bond, the more stable carbocation would be the internal carbocation, the secondary carbocation. And so indeed our protonation occurs on the end of the molecule to give us a methyl group on the end of the molecule. But this secondary carbocation is right next to a highly substituted carbon. And so what that means is that we can undergo a methyl shift where this methyl group, actually any of these methyl groups, but to track it, I've turned one of them blue. This methyl group moves over and it jumps with its electrons, with its electrons into the empty carbocation P orbital that is next door. When that happens, of course, that carbon rehybridizes to create, uh, create a new um, tetrahedral center here. And we leave behind an empty orbital on the carbon that had the methyl group, which will now be a carbocation, right? So we have a, we've gone from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. And now this tertiary carbocation is more stable. And so the equilibrium will favor this tertiary carbocation and then the water molecule can attack at this site. And after deprotonation, we will get this, um, actually a, sec a tertiary alcohol as the major product. All right, someone's asked in the chat box, would there ever be a scenario where we would shift something in order to form a primary carbocation instead of a more stable tertiary one? No, the answer is no. All of these alkyl shifts and the hydride shifts, they only occur in order to give you a more stable carbocation intermediate. You want to go down the energy pathway to create a more stable intermediate. So you're, you're not likely to create a less stable carbocation using a shift. Good question. Okay. So this hydration of this particular alkene um, 
is not great because you get this rearrangement. And indeed, anytime you want to do a hydration of alkenes, this sulfuric acid method or the dilute acid method has a strong potential for rearrangements. And also sulfuric acid is kind of a harsh reagent by itself. I mean, it sounds like it should be, and indeed it is. And so if you have any other functional groups in your molecule that are sensitive, that sulfuric acid might be impacting other things as well. So we as chemists, we need to come up with a, a way to get around this problem. What if I did want to hydrate this double bond directly and put my OH group here? So before I move on, I see there's a question in the chat box. Uh, why is the first one more substituted? Because they both have two methyl groups. Okay. So um, in this case on the far left, where our carbocation is, is a secondary carbocation. This carbon is bonded to two other carbons. And then after we do the shift, we have a carbon, a carbocation that's bonded to three carbons. And so this is a tertiary carbocation in the middle. Um, and then another question in the chat box says, is an allylic tertiary carbocation preferred over a regular, a regular tertiary carbocation here as well? Yes, anytime you have an allylic carbocation, that is going to give you an extra boost of stability. And so that will help as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't have any allylic carbocations in this case, but if we did, and if we could rearrange to create that, that rearrangement would be a likely re rearrangement to happen. Okay, let's move on. Um, because what I really want to get to is how we get around this issue of uh, not having to rearrange our hydration products, our intermediates, excuse me. So we are going to come up as chemists with a set of reagents that takes a different mechanistic approach to get to the same answer we want. And so that is going to be called oxymercuration, demercuration. These are big, crazy words. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I only have a couple minutes left so you can get a flavor for it. And we'll break it down and go through it more slowly on Monday. All right, so like I said, hydration doesn't work in real life very well, but we still need a way to make Markovnikov addition to a double bond um, where we get a water addition. And the way we're gonna do that is called oxymercuration demercuration, where we're gonna employ a reagent called mercuric acetate. This mercuric acetate is going to add across the double bond in a way that mercury bonds with carbon on one side and an OH from a water molecule goes on the other side. And then we can replace that mercury bond with a hydrogen bond. And the end result of this approach will be a Markovnikov orientation. This is gonna give us a lot of benefits. They are gonna be milder conditions than doing hydration because we don't have to use sulfuric acid. And this will avoid rearrangements completely. It'll also avoid the polymerization that John asked about in the last class, which is a real problem with hydration. All right, so mechanistically, I'm gonna show you this briefly and I'll post these slides and we'll talk about it again next week. Mercuric acetate looks like this. OAC stands for acetate and that is this piece down here, an oxygen connected to a carbonyl connected to a methyl group. This mercuric acetate is actually an equilibrium with sort of the two ion pairs of it. And this mercury acetate cation is the active electrophile in this reaction. And what happens is that the pi electrons of our double bond reach out and grab, this is electrophilic, you can tell that because of its positive charge. So the pi electrons reach out on um, and attack the carbocation of, of, it's not a carbocation, excuse me, the positive charge of the mercury. And then the lone pair of electrons can make a new bond with the other carbon. So these are happening all at the same time where we're gonna form this three-membered intermediate. We have two new sigma bonds. The electrons for one of those bonds came from the pi bond and the electrons for the other came from the mercury reagent. And so we have this three-membered inter intermediate, three-membered ring intermediate called a mercurinium ion. And that mercurinium ion can then be attacked by a water molecule in an actual SN2 fashion. So this mercury still has its positive charge. We didn't destroy any positive charges, right? So we have to conserve our charge. Water can attack from the backside of this bond and release 
these electrons, because otherwise we'd break the octet rule for carbon, give those electrons back to mercury. So now we've quenched our positive charge on mercury and we've formed our carbon oxygen bond. After deprotonation, we have this intermediate, which is indeed the product of the oxymercuration step of this two-step sequence. And I just want to note, there is no carbocation here. We have never generated a free carbocation, so there is no chance for there to be a rearrangement in this reaction sequence. So we'll talk more about this next week. I'm out of time for now, but I will post all the slides about oxymercuration, and you guys can um, look through those. And I, there will be also a practice problem, and they're not for you to turn in, but just for you to try out on your own. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Hi, thank you. You're welcome, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, bye guys. Thank you, Professor, have a good weekend. Uh, you're welcome, thank you. And you guys have a good weekend too. Oh yeah, thank you. Somebody just reminded me, the class participation from the last class is due tonight. I, I uh, let that uh, deadline be a little bit later because of not having enough time during class last time. Thanks for that reminder. Um, I have a question about um, quiz three. So, um, or I'm sorry, exam three. Um, I believe it falls on the week of the 18th. Um, I Is that right? have posted, so I, the syllabus only has tentative exam dates and I have not yet posted when it will be. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to let you know that I have a um, medical 